All right, today uh, we have an extra special guest joining us, uh, Luke from 100% Star Wars, and I love your YouTube channel, and I, I can tell that you love talking about Knights of the Old Republic 2 and Kreia and Malachor 5, so of course we are having you on to talk about KOTOR and Darth Malak and the Leviathan. Uh, how are you doing, Luke? I am doing well. As I mentioned, I am swelteringly hot, but um, I'm doing as good as I can be. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So in case our listeners uh, haven't seen your channel yet, like, what do you do over there? Oh, a bit of everything, really, in the old uh, Star Wars stratosphere of YouTube. Um, I mainly focus on Knights of the Old Republic, obviously. Um, a lot of my channel is lore-based. I do weekly streams playing Star Wars games. Um, I review things here and there. It's it's like um, what's the word? What's what's the way to put it? It's just it's everything Star. Wars. It's a hundred percent Star Wars, right? It's in the name. Um, all kinds of Star Wars content, Old Republic, Canon, Legends. It's it's there's something for everybody. Yeah. How did you uh, discover Knights of the Old Republic? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it was about two thousand and four or five. I can't remember the exact year. But I remember exactly when I got the game and my dad had come home from work and I had the original Xbox, so I wasn't on PC and he had come home with Republic Commando and Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2. And I remember, obviously, as a kid, you know, the Clone Wars was uh, the prequel trilogy, sorry, was very popular. And obviously, I was super excited about playing Republic Commando, you know, becoming that that clone commando. And I sort of brushed Knights of the Old Republic aside, thinking it wasn't going to be as, as special. And I played, I think I played like an hour or two of Republic Commando, loved it. And then I thought I'd try Knights of the Old Republic. And I was only like, how old was I? Like nine or eight at this time. And I remember putting in Knights of the Old Republic 2 and just being just overwhelmed with this incredible story and this incredible game that just, it sucked me in and I didn't stop playing it for like it, it felt like weeks as a child like it felt like I was playing it forever um and I've just I've been obsessed literally obsessed with with the franchise more specifically too but yeah that it's it's just the most incredible game and it and it, it it really defined my childhood in a way and especially my appreciation for storytelling and for narrative and and themes and all those things in storytelling it's just it's an important game to me and I love it so much. <laughs> I didn't realize you'd basically grown up with it. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. it's <laughs> Obviously, as a kid, especially with KOTOR 2, you, I don't think you fully understand it. And I don't think I fully appreciated it as a kid. I just saw it, you know, I just saw it as, you know, lightsabers, Jedi, Sith. You get to choose who you want to be. Like, I, it was only until maybe like four or five years later when I started to get into my early teens that I started to actually appreciate it in a thematical sense more than it was just a Star Wars story. And, you know, I made friends, like one of my best friends. We literally became friends because of KOTOR 2. I had a, a nihilist profile picture on Facebook and he saw it and messaged me and then all of a sudden we became best friends and we're still friends <laughs> to this day and that was like 10 years ago. So, um, yeah, it's incredible. And it, it's it's quite funny because I had the reverse experience with KOTOR where I played the second one first yeah. And I played the first one about how many? It must have been about three or four four years later because I didn't have a a PC at the time, and you couldn't buy the original game on Xbox in the UK. You couldn't find it. It was really difficult to get, so I had to wait before I could play the first game for years. So it gave me a unique, I think, a unique perspective on Kotor playing it in reverse order. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think Kotor two was a slow burn when it came out, uh, just because it it was not finished all the way and i think like a lot of people had played the first nights of the old republic were kind of expecting one thing but then yeah. kotor mm -hmm. 2 went like a completely different direction mm -hmm. but i think given time like a lot of people came around to it and a lot of people have ended up preferring nights of the old republic too yeah i, I completely agree with you it's kind of like the whole um it's kind of like the whole um Force Awakens Last Jedi discourse, right? Yeah. The mm -hmm. first one was very traditional Star Wars, and then the second one just decided to go crazy. 
it's the exact same kind of thing. And obviously The Last Jedi at the moment is very divisive. A lot of people dislike it for not being the Star Wars that they grew up with, you know? And I think it was the same with KOTOR. People were expecting a very similar kind of experience and what they got was just not a similar kind of experience. Definitely. Yeah, so what would you say keeps you coming back to KOTOR? Like, is it the themes? Is it the characters or something else? Well, I have to be honest and say my channel is is what keeps me coming back. Um, Obviously, I I love Star Wars and I love Knights of the Old Republic, but I I don't think I would be as, as invested into it on the tiny level that I am now on the minute level um, without my channel. So, but what makes me come back is there's always, there's always something new. The amount, like I I've streamed Knights of the Old Republic two from beginning to end twice now for my channel. Hmm. And the amount of times you go through it and you're like, Hmm, I didn't know you could do that. Or, Hmm, I didn't know this person, you know, had this quest line, you know, there's always something new to discover. And it's how many years, 15 years later. And I, I don't know of a game, or should I say, well, with Knights of the Old Republic 1 and 2, I don't know of a game franchise where I, I always seem to discover something different every time I play it. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a real testament to the depth of of what they made. Yeah, I was uh, recently watching a playthrough uh, on YouTube. I don't remember the name of the channel offhand. Yeah, just making a couple of different decisions, and it plays almost like a completely different game yeah. than then uh you know when you make your your decisions so just a a couple of tweaks and you know the angle of the story is just completely different so that's really fascinating it's it's crazy like i've i've made at this point it feels like i've i've literally spent my life reading about revan and kraya and all these nice theater public characters because I, I when i when i do my research i go into everything just to make sure everything's concrete and correct and even now I, I still find new dialogue from Kraya that I've never heard before. And I think to myself, I literally spent three days researching this character. <laughs> and now here comes another line that I've never heard. It's, it's brilliant. If we can ever find a way to get Sarah Kesselman on our podcast, like maybe <laughs> she, dream. we can dream. Like yeah. maybe she'd be like, it was 15 years ago. You guys are still talking about this. And we'd be <laughs> like, yeah, like we're invested. Like, but it it would be amazing if that were I ever... would love to speak to her. Just just to pick her brain happen. about what she thought. You know, because yeah. she created this incredible portrayal of a character that's become arguably like one of the greatest written characters in Star Wars. Yeah. And become a, a character that so many people have kind of taken influence from and been affected by. And I, I just wonder if she knows how much of an impact she had on so many thousands, maybe millions of people. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd love to just see what she has to say and see what she thinks. Yeah, Kray is like a top three Star Wars character of all time for me. And like, I, I have no idea how they were able to write such a compelling character and game in the limited amount of time they had. But uh, it's incredible. They mm-hmm. did. It really is. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. So on that note. We can talk about Darth Malak because I know that's what everyone is here for. So let's take a quick break and we can move on to our next topic. So I think you said you're kind of against a KOTOR adaptation like at all whatsoever. Is that is that right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, obviously, a, a part of me as a as a fan of movies would love to see you know something that has been so important to me growing up on the silver screen you know seeing Revan seeing Bastler and HK and the start seeing all this on on screen would it would appease my my inner child but I when I think about it logically I, I don't think it would it wouldn't work because the amount of depth and the amount of connection you have to the game as you're playing it loses its spark if you put it into a a condensed two-hour movie even if it was a seven or eight hour trilogy i I don't think you could you could do it justice and you can see the amount of movie uh sorry game to movie adaptations that just fail and they're just awful 
And I, I don't necessarily think it's the lack of quality behind the writers or the directors of those movies. I just think transferring a game into a movie form doesn't capture what makes the game special. And I think that's why why they fail. And I really, I'm really concerned if they tried to do that with Knights of the Old Republic because people have such high expectations of these games. Um, they are, for a lot of people, the pinnacle of what Star Wars is, right? Yeah. And if you get that wrong as a movie, I think it's it makes Knights of the Old Republic a lot more hated within a bigger audience. So if they made it as a remake, for example, the rumoured Aspire remake, if that didn't quite hit the mark, it would still be a relatively niche group of fans that would dislike it. Whereas if you made a bad movie or a movie that just doesn't capture it, it's a general, it's more of a general Star Wars audience that are going to see this. And I wouldn't want to have that negative stigma around the KOTOR franchise if that happened, you know? Yeah, I can understand that. Um, I guess I, I've always grown up with, with movies and, like, I've always been someone who's, like, kind of been a bit more experimental, kind of like maybe Frankenstein, you know, was <laughs> was written about me you know it's kind of like but what if we try it you know like let's yeah. just try it you know mm-hmm. um but what do you think brian those are definitely some valid concerns and um you bring up the good point about video game movies just just in general and it's kind of the same argument you get for movies that are adapted from books a lot of times right so you're you're playing this game knights of the old republic or you know any other game and you're spending you know, 40 plus hours with these characters and how do you condense that down into a uh, shortened narrative? And that's where a lot of these things get lost. But I I kind of look at it a different way. So, I mean, you have uh, Knights of the Old Republic, which is, which is a game that a lot of people played, but certainly not as many people that like Star Wars as a whole. And that certainly is not as many people, you know, just in the general public of people. So if you don't do something like a movie or a series, then you just have a a huge portion of the population that never are going to hear these stories and never get to learn about these characters. Um, so I, I, I see the argument against it and I, I kind of see the argument for it and I'm, I'm leaning just, just on the argument uh, for it. But yeah, it definitely has to be done uh, with some care for sure. If I, if I was going to put it into a live action medium, I, I think an animated show or a live action show would be better than a movie mm-hmm. simply because, you know, you can have two or three seasons with 10 episodes all an hour long. You know, you can, you can sort of stretch it a little bit more than you can in a movie, but the only problem with that is budget limitations. You know, a, a movie that's two hundred and fifty million dollars in a budget is going to be so much better than a, a TV show that's got a fifty million budget. You know, mm-hmm. so I, I mean, isn't the Mandalorian something like a hundred million per episode in budget? I something believe ridiculous so. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's so, I, it's something like that. And I think the uh, the Lord of the Rings that Amazon's doing, I think, is push it as close to like yeah. 150 million dollars or something yeah, like that so. i think it's yeah. even more than that i'm kind of like how are they are they just wanting to do a tax write-off or something i have no <laughs> idea how they're gonna make money so jeff can swing it he he can uh he can write the checks for it i guess so <laughs> but yeah i mean i i grew up with the rise of comic book movies so i i can kind of remember the argument that there were a lot of bad um, yes. comic yeah. book movies, but until, like, I feel like Iron Man in 2008, which was uh, directed by John Favreau as well, mm-hmm. um, yep. they kind of finally made it real, like, you could kind of believe it, like it was happening. They found the balance. They, yeah. they, they found a unique balance that, that made it feel connectable and relatable while also being absurd and... They they seem to get that right with every single Marvel movie. Yeah. And before that, though, like like you said, there was some absolute trash from Marvel. It took a long time for them to finally strike that perfect balance. Yeah. I, I don't think you could do that with 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 Star Wars. I think, especially with how hungry the fan base are and how high their expectations are, if you don't get it right straight away, then you're in for a a downward spiral of fan hatred. I mean, I just I I tried to look at the sequel trilogy as a whole of what could what could happen, and I think you know 
I don't know where I'm going with this, but um, <laughs> I, I try to think of the sequel trilogy as like a, this is the sort of fundamental basis for what could go wrong, what could go right. And you, you saw with The Force Awakens, they, they kind of got it right. They managed to appease to the original fans. They managed to sort of, those original trilogy fans, like the older audience, uh, they found that balance between what made the prequels the prequels and what made the originals the originals. But then they just kind of lost the plot. Um, and I don't say that in a bad way, like The Last Jedi is bad. They just kind of, they lost kind of focus. They they were trying too much to appease to certain parts of the fan base. They didn't just come in with a story to tell. Um, and, and that's yeah. what worries me about KOTOR. I worry that if they made the first episode, they would then make the second one to appease to all of the sort of negative sides that, the fans saw in the episode one and they did the same thing with three. So I don't know. I just, I'm not, I'd, I'd rather see it as a TV show. I, I, if you give someone like John Favreau, I mean, the man is clearly a master in, in finding that balance. Um, he's proven it time and time again. I, I, I think he could pull off a show, but a movie is just, it's too, it's too dangerous for me. You know, I, I wouldn't want the whole star Wars fandom seeing Knights of the Old Republic and being like, what a load of rubbish. Even though the games are quite possibly the best thing in the whole in the whole franchise, so yeah. Yeah, and I I can definitely understand that. Sometimes uh, the Star Wars fan base, I think, is what sometimes what holds Star Wars back yes. from exploring uh, more themes and possibilities, mm-hmm. and. Maybe in 10 years, maybe the people who grew up with Knights of the Old Republic and maybe there would be another remake or something or a remaster, maybe that would come out and like people would be uh, more open to like a cinematic adaptation. But I think where things are headed is more to Disney Plus and to make uh, live action yeah. TV shows. Yeah, the, the shows, shows are definitely Disney's focus at the moment, I think. Yeah. Especially over cinema. Yeah, I, I, which is different. I, I just love film so much, and mm-hmm. sometimes I think like film just looks better than some of the best <laughs> shows, you know. But yeah, I'm open to you know storytelling wherever it goes, like even if it's like an interesting transition. And you can find us on Instagram at Evan Hawk Podcast. And if you want to connect with me, I can be found on Instagram at astro underscore droid underscore. On Patreon, the link is in our Instagram bio, or you can find it at www.patreon.com slash Podcast. The Ebon Hawk can be found on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, as well as everywhere else that Anchor Podcasts are distributed. Subscriptions, reviews, and shares help us out. Our intro and outro themes were composed by Alistair Shoreman at alistairsounds.wixsite.com forward slash alistairsounds. Our transition music was composed by Christian Walker at christianwalkermusic.com. This episode of the Evan Hawk podcast has been brought to you by Nikki Dog from Patreon. May the force be with you. We will be back soon. Bye for now. <laughs>